but it's finding people that you can learn with. And of course, you know, I'm preaching to the choir uh, with with you and your and your online community. But I think we need more of those for more people with a real structure embedded, a philosophy of learning embedded, so that people can figure out what they're supposed to do in that community. ADHD Rewired episode 421. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups, you can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Aaron Reese. Aaron has worked in professional development for close to a decade, specializing in self-directed, peer-supported experiential learning. He believes learning is a survival skill. Aaron is new to the ADHD diagnosis, and he is joining us from across the pond. Aaron, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I am doing well. So uh, we are recording this on uh, January 4th. Mm-hmm. So you were recently diagnosed with, with ADHD. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in, uh, I think around October. In October, okay. So very recently. Okay, and what brought you to that diagnosis? So I think for a long time I've been aware that I don't think the same as a lot of people around me and also aware that most of my friends are also very weird and uh, and sort of uh, I was speaking to my nephew who has recently been diagnosed with ADHD and he was like well have you checked I was like okay well I started looking into it as you do and uh, reading all this stuff and it's like ah this would explain a lot so I, I ended up sort of doing a few online questionnaires checked with my doctor put me on a very long waiting list to see a psychiatrist so I decided to go private and sort of, yeah, that's that's really it. This has been basically over the course of the last year, um, maybe year and a half. And it's really, it's fascinating because once you get the diagnosis, once you understand what it's about, certain things do start to make more sense. And I find that quite comforting. So one of the things that I think is really interesting is what you do professionally. Mm-hmm. And you, know, you mentioned in your in your bio that just the idea that you believe that learning is a survival skill. And I actually really think that's a, a really great concept because work really is changing, you know, since COVID and, and everything. So I think it'd be great for us to want to explore what it is that we can do if we are trying to learn uh, new skills with this idea of, you know, learning and development is sort of what you're, you're working on professionally um, and how we can sort of apply that both in our work worlds as well as personally um, and how we manage our ADHD and then um, after we uh, kind of explore that a little bit, and you're saying that you are interested in uh, a little bit of coaching yeah, around structure not? and time. So that is what we are going to try to bite off today. So let's first start with how work is changing. Mm, yeah, this is one of those things that's going to sound to a lot of people like a bit of a broken record. I think it's been happening for a long time. Uh, the move from office-based, well, I'm going to be speaking here specifically about sort of knowledge workers, I suppose, because I think when people like me talk about this stuff, we tend to ignore all the people whose jobs involve physically doing things. Uh, And that is still a significant chunk of the population, and they tend to get ignored in these conversations. But for those of us who who do work that tends to look like sitting doing nothing, um, you know, behind a, in front of a, a, a keyboard, that tends to be shifting towards sort of working from home. We have far less direct connection with people whilst we're working. So it's a bit more isolating than it used to be. And in that regard, COVID has really only been a, um, an accelerator uh, for that. That's a trend that's been happening for a long time and it's um, it's been pushed forward. 
And I think also, and this is probably more directly applicable to everyone, the, the duration of most jobs is, I think the average tenure in a, in a job these days is something like three or four years. Um, it, this was, it was a while ago, I looked at those stats, so it may have changed, and it probably hasn't gone back up. And I think the specific challenge of this shortening tenure in jobs when it comes to how we learn, how we perform, is that the way we do the the L and D or the the learning and development, the uh, training, if we use the more uh, general term, that hasn't really changed. We still kind of deliver that in broadly the same ways. Some of it's been shifted to these online platforms where you get uh, videos delivered to you with uh, little multiple choice questions at the end. And w- w- um, would you say that a lot of those, I think, are sort of geared more towards like compliance versus actual learning? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the learning is defined, if we define learning, we should define learning, I suppose, as a change of behavior as a result of memory. Oh. Um, so if we, if we define learning that way, nobody changes their behavior as a result of, uh, <laughs> of these terrible sort of PowerPoint uh, things, which really are they're, they're um uh arse covering by the uh by the organization you work for because they can prove if you do something wrong that they have instructed you you shouldn't have done that and uh and that's that's good for them and the other side of it sometimes it's to do with employee engagement so you send people on these expensive uh rather flashy courses with expensive flashy uh people um talking to them and it entertains them makes them feel good they get to network there isn't necessarily a lot of learning there, though. So, so a lot of it is, as you say, compliance, and another big chunk of it is purely um, massaging the egos of the the most important people or the the upcoming leaders of the, of the future. So, not a lot of learning in learning and development, unfortunately. So, whether we are trying to learn a new skill ourselves or a new job, from what you're doing professionally, what what do we know about? what is actually needed for learning, for genuine learning, not just regurgitation, but genuine learning. What What is needed for that? Um, learning, um, and this should be pretty, it's one of those things that once you hear it, it seems really obvious, but learning begins with what you're interested in. And when I say interested, I don't just mean sort of interested, like you saw a video on YouTube and that was interesting, but interested because it matters. It's a concern of yours in your real life. So, Everyone's met uh, a 14 year old boy or possibly any age of boy these days who plays Pokemon and remembers every single Pokemon in their Pokedex can tell you everything about it. I'm just imagining all of our, our women who are really into Pokemon. So, uh, oh no, <laughs> did I just, did I just, um, I just, I just uh, erased the, the female gaming population. I'm sorry. I'm speaking from personal experience. It's always uh, my nephews. Um, yes, I shall, I shall uh, correct the record there that women also play Pokemon. Um, <laughs> But I've never met one who regurgitates the way uh, the way my nephews have, and um, they can tell you everything there is about about these Pokemon, and uh, and the reason they remember these things is it matters because there's something they care about is improved or made better in some way or changed in a positive way because they remember those things, and yet they can't remember what they learned about real animals in their sort of uh, biology class because it doesn't matter to them it's not important unless they care about their grade which is not a natural concern but one that we have to build for them so the first thing is to understand that your concerns whether it's something that comes directly from something in your life say i'm i'm going to learn about say pokemon or uh, uh, or you know the kind of music the person i i fancy likes because that matters to me it's going to help me get something i want fingers crossed but the the stuff that we want them to to learn about frequently we don't put any effort into finding a way to make them care so that's the first thing you have to care about it you have to connect to that emotional drive in a very real way it's not good enough to say oh i will learn this because it's going to help me be a better employee nobody cares about being a better employee they care about getting home earlier to see their kids they care about not stressing next time they have a performance review so you've got to get to a genuine level of, of what do you really care about and forgive yourself for the things you don't care about because it's okay. And, and I think that to sort of uh, put a point on that, when I'm coaching and we're coming up with goals and they're sharing that they're kind of just like stuck on this particular goal. And, you know, I often meet, we kind of drill down and, and ask like, is this a goal that's actually important to you? Or is this something that someone else is kind of encouraging you to do and... Is it only important to you maybe because that person is important to you? And is that enough of, a, of an interest to keep you engaged? 
And sometimes it's not. Absolutely. That is a major issue with, as you say, any kind of work you're trying to do. If the, a lot of people don't spend enough time observing those, those motivators and they realize they've been motivated by something or they've, they've tried to pretend they're motivated by something they're not really motivated by. And there's a lot of social pressure. And in work, uh, we all have to pretend to be very interested in a lot of things which we just don't care about. Do, do you think that it's through pretending that we're interested? Or do you think, because I know that sometimes, you know, there are things in our life where we're, it's like we have these lies that we're telling ourselves, but we believe that we don't realize that there's this like disconnect between what we say we want and what we say we are interested in and what we're actually interested in? Yes. Uh, I mean, that's a, a whole new level of pretending when, you, when you've actually managed to fool yourself. And we are very gullible to our own lies, unfortunately. Um, and the, <laughs> that's where people, there's a, there's a difference between wanting a thing and wanting to do what is necessary to get that thing. So for years, I've been saying I wanted to be able to play the piano. So I'll say, I want to learn the piano, but actually I don't want to learn the piano. I want to have learned it. Um, uh, so, so the process of learning the piano is long, slow, laborious, and often very boring. I don't want to actually do it. I want it to have happened so that I can now play the piano. And that's obviously not good enough. You have to, you have to fall in love with the process. And in order to sustain that, that uh, emotion. So anything that you, you try and do long term to sustain that drive, you require a, a much deeper connection to it than that would be neat. But it has to be something really meaningful. So the, the why has to be real and has to be mm. near term? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be near term, but it has to, if it's long term, then I suppose it needs to be even more uh, dramatic in its, in, it, in, in its power. But certainly it has to be real. And I think when it comes to our workplaces, our, our employers and teammates need to start being more honest about, you know, what really motivates people and stop pretending that we should all be motivated by, you know, working for whatever big conglomerate happens to employ us and start really dealing with real human needs. Mm. So what else? So when we having the information or whatever it is that we are wanting to learn, uh, actually needs to be relevant and something we care about. What else is important in the, the realm of like, how, how do we really learn? Hmm. Um, so well, if we begin by having something we really genuinely care about, we're motivated deeply, then the next thing we need to do is give something up. And this is somewhere we fall down, I think, all the time. And I do. It, someone says, I'm going to learn this, and they really mean it. Uh, but they they don't realize that the 20 minutes a day or the two hours a week that they need to put into that that's something else they can't do. Time is is finite. And um, too often we pretend that we can just stretch our time. So when people try and do something, they find they've not really gotten around to it. That phrase, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. What that means is they haven't realized that they don't have an extra hour in the day. They can't do that. So first you've got to say, well, what am I going to stop doing? And you may have to be quite ruthless because it's going to be a thing that you do for a reason. It's going to be something you enjoy, need, like. Um, so you're going to have to make sacrifices. Okay. So, um, when it comes to like something like exercise, uh, I often hear people say, I don't have the time to do it. And you know, if it's a true priority, I say, you don't, you don't find the time, you make the time. Mm. No one has time. Time is not a thing you have. It's a, it's, it's, um, it's a weird thing. I just recently read a book called 4,000 Weeks, uh, Time Management for Mortals. Um, that is apparently the average human lifespan, 4,000 weeks. So I'm roughly halfway through that, and that's terrifying. 2,000 weeks does not sound like a long time, does it? And a big chunk of that is saying even if you were really ruthless and you got rid of all the things that were anything less than genuinely meaningful to you, you would still have to leave a huge amount of meaningful things on the table because you genuinely just don't have enough hours in the day. So once you've made a commitment and you care about something, you've carved out the time, what else is, is sort of essential for, for learning uh, a new skill or a new uh, a new uh, ability. I think the next step is normally one people put off way too late, and that is to ask experts. Usually people want to, so the people who tidy up before the cleaner comes around or the people who try and lose weight before they join a gym, they feel like they need to get to a certain level before they can expose their uh, 
their efforts to people. Uh, frequently, people do this with learning as well. They feel like they have to get to a certain point before they can start talking to people who genuinely know what they're talking about. And that usually leads to a huge amount of wasted time. People tend to uh, learn the wrong thing or spend too much time on something that isn't that important. So, so I would say the next thing to do is to, to speak to people who genuinely know this stuff, ask them. And when they give you advice, be very careful not to follow it. And by which I mean, take it on board. Um, advice is, uh, what do I say, the, the worst vice is advice, right? It's, uh, it's, they will be well-meaning, take it on board, but don't allow it to, to entirely overtake your own will. But you should be checking with people who have experience with things, who know about things before you really set off. You may find that in doing so, you decide, actually, I don't want to learn this. Maybe it's the wrong path for you. It's much better to find out early on and choose a different one. Uh, than to to find out halfway through. So you're saying, so let's say someone's, you know, quote unquote, working for the man and they're like, oh, I'm tired of working for the man. I, I want to start my own business. What would you say is the first step for, for someone or, or some of those first steps? Well, interesting. I want to start my own business. Uh, I suppose I'd ask them why. Uh, starting your own business is a very good, enjoy. It's, it's a lovely thing to try and do. It's very hard. Um, you have to have a very good reason for doing it. There are lots and lots of downsides. I'd say you begin by going into it with an open, uh, with open eyes uh, about what it is you're doing. Maybe the man that you're working for is just the wrong man uh, or woman. I suppose we, I shouldn't. I should not erase half of all employers as well, or not half, but that's that's a problem for another conversation. Um, the <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say that the first thing you do is really question whether that's the correct answer, because I often remind myself that people don't want a drill, they want a hole. So when someone says, I want to start a business, do they want to start a business or do they just need to find meaning in what they're doing? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I do is push back on the assumption that that's the right answer. Uh, because it's a really, really hard road. I've done it. It's very hard. It's very stressful. It's soul destroying at times. And that's not to say it doesn't have great upsides, but there are there are questions there. But if if uh, the person decides, yes, this is what I want, and I've heard all the warnings, the first thing I think is to to really understand what it is is deeply motivating them. Make sure that they're not going to succeed in designing a a business that they don't want to run. So understand that you're gonna don't don't successfully fail uh, at, at building yourself a, a a situation you don't want to be in. Um, and yeah, you really do then need to figure out well, what am I willing to sacrifice to do this? You know, am I willing to sacrifice the uh, I know in America you have uh, you have health insurance for your businesses um, for your employers, uh, which as a British citizen I find horrifying. Uh, but you know that's just the that's that's the uh, the pond that that's one of the things that separates us. Um, I think a lot of Americans find it horrifying as well. Um, but yeah, you've got to ask: Am I willing to sacrifice the security? Am I willing to sacrifice the stability? Am I willing to sacrifice the um, the time that I may have spent with my friends and family, because you will have to pull all night as you will have to work weekends. And then if you are willing to make those sacrifices, go into that again with those open eyes and go start by really understanding what you're getting into. Speak to people who know what they're doing, run experiments to check on your assumptions. There's a fantastic book called The Lean Startup, which um, did, uh, did a lot of business uh, a few years ago. But the ideas in there really do uh, hold true. You have to test your assumptions um, and know what it is. Uh, you know, you're going to be wrong about a bunch of stuff. Be willing to uh, to test what you believe and change your mind when it turns out you are in fact completely wrong. So we're gonna pause there to take a, a quick break. When we come back, I just want to touch on two things that you said were key parts of the future of learning, and then let's get into coaching. So we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our coaching community. Last week, we finished our 27th season of coaching and accountability groups, and a huge congratulations to every single one of you. You made it, and you can do hard things. That means we are now just a few weeks away from starting our 28th season on April 13th. If you would like to join our spring coaching and accountability groups, we have six spots left. We have 
four spots in section two with Coach Cat that meets Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern, and two spots left in section four with Coach Cat. We have one of those two spots reserved for someone in the Americas and the American time zones, and one is for someone that is in and around Australia. Because my brain tends to hear womp, womp, womp when I hear too many details and numbers, head on over to coachingrewired.com to see section dates and times. We are going to do one final registration event on March 30th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. And if you are in or around the Australian area, you will be able to set up a time to meet with Coach Cat to get yourself registered. Both my section and Moira's section are full, but there is still an opportunity to get on the wait list. Getting on our wait list does require you to go through our registration process and make a $100 deposit, which is fully refundable. Go to coachingrewired.com to get signed up for our final registration events. And after you've confirmed your email, you'll receive instructions for all the pre-registration requirements. Registration is by invitation only, and we'd love to have you. If 10 weeks of intensive coaching next to other adults with ADHD sounds like something you would like to add to your ADHD toolbox, don't wait. Go to coachingrewired.com and click on the green button to start your registration process. And if you feel feel like you're still waiting for your invitation and you know you've submitted your information, send us an email at support at ADHDrewire.com. And to our members already confirmed to start with us on April 13th, this is your friendly reminder to read or listen to The One Thing by Gary Keller. We do ask that all of our coaching members read this before we begin. So whether you're new to the podcast or you've been listening for a while and you want to join our award-winning coaching and accountability groups, you can learn more by going to coachingrewired.com. Come grow with us. The website again is coachingrewired.com. Hey, would you like someone to do laundry with? Do you need to get your tax documents in order? What about having company while you study? Then try out our Adult Study Hall membership community at adultstudyhall.com. Access to Adult Study Hall is only $19.99 a month and is free for the first week. You can cancel your membership at any time without any penalty. Your membership will give you access to our Adult Study Hall 24-7 or ASH 24-7 room, which is a dedicated Zoom room that's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you need more structure and quick moments to verbally process, you will also gain access to our Adult Study Hall Plus or ASH Plus sessions. We've got sessions for writing, working out, credit tasks, job search and career advancements, and even a session dedicated to finances and working on those taxes. And next week, I am hosting a special three-hour Pomodoro Dance Party work session on Monday, March 28th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern to tackle your to-dos and get your body moving. We'll be doing 50-minute work cycles and 10-minute dance breaks. You can join us for a bit, but we'd invite you to stick around for all of it. If you show up on time, we'll get launched with a five-minute dance party to warm up. Dancing is required if your surroundings and body allow, but dance skills are not. Come move with us. You're invited to join the virtual co-working community for adults with ADHD who just get it. Head on over now to adultstudyhall.com to learn more about our ASH Plus sessions, our 24-7 drop-in room, and to stay up to date for any other upcoming sessions. Come work with us. Come grow with us. Go to adultstudyhall.com. All right, we are back with Aaron Reese. All right, so when we talked a couple weeks ago, you said there was two things critical for the future of learning, and you said that it's self-directed and peer-supported. Yeah, Um, so this kind of gets to the question of people can't be made to learn something they don't care about. Uh, or that is that it's not 100 percent true we have figured out how to make people learn things they don't care about it's uh rote learning it's repetition it's uh it's beating people over the head with a times table um a book until they will forever remember the horrific um so sort of the painful memory of, of of having to remember all these things it's industrialized um, education yeah i mean well yes unfortunately most of it um i hope it's not as bad as it once was and again i say this knowing that 
I know many teachers who are wonderful people and genuinely want to teach the right way. Unfortunately, when the assumption is that the success of this process is that you will achieve certain results on standardized tests, then you don't have the luxury to allow people to explore what they genuinely care about, because unless it turns out the test is on that, you will be considered a failure as a teacher, they will be considered a failure as a student, your school will lose funding and lots of other terrible things will happen. So yeah, that that's yeah, when we when we do teaching that way, we forget that it's about your individual's interests and concerns and, and passions and curiosities. So when you switch to a more self-directed approach, and yeah, this is not new. I mean, uh, I think Montessori uh, teaching is very much focused on this, and I'm certain that other styles of teaching also are. My daughter went to a Montessori nursery for a couple of years, and uh, we took we had lots of really great conversations about that child-led learning. So it's been around for a while, this idea, but we're still not doing it um, for most people. And I think when it's self-directed, it must necessarily be about what interests you, what concerns you. There are two forms of self-directed, I suppose. It's self-directed in so much as your boss says, you've got to learn this, go and figure out how. That's not really what, what I mean. I mean, the boss says, okay, how would you like to improve your life? Uh, what would it mean to you to be more successful in, uh, in your work? And if what it means to you is to spend less time doing it, uh, then great, that's what you should focus on. If it means being more competitive because you want to be the best, you know, that's fine as well. But it has to be driven by that that self-directed. So you start with your concerns and you get to that question of, okay, now that I know what I want, how do I get there? So self-directed, but not that doesn't mean you're left isolated. So the peer supported part comes in there. And that is to say that people in the last year or so, we saw this dramatically demonstrated with uh, university campuses, college campuses being closed down and a lot of students wondering why am i paying so much for this material what they realized was in fact a huge part of the value of going to a university was the peer group that you get to spend time around the community that you have there and i think it's a terrible shame that outside of formal education most of us don't have access to a, a peer group like that when it comes to learning. So, so my feeling is that we need to help people build these peer groups and communities uh, through which they will uh, support one another in their learning. I think, you know, especially with COVID um, and just the, uh, the way online uh, stuff has been going, it seems to be that there is an online community for just about everything these days. I think the, you know, it's, it's one of these things where it's, I think often people don't stop to explore, like, is there a community for this abstract thing that I want to learn? Like, probably. Right. And it's finding them, right? It's finding them. It's, uh, it's figuring out how to interact with them. I think um, online is probably, I mean, this, this is very useful. I think face-to-face uh, -face can be very useful as well, uh, depending on what it is you're doing. But it's finding people that you can learn with. And of course, you know, I'm preaching to the choir uh, with with you and your in your online community, but I think we need more of those for more people with a real structure embedded, a philosophy of learning embedded, so that people can figure out what they're supposed to do in that community, and that's where really learning how to learn kind of comes into it, understanding the the mechanics of it. All right, all right, let's let's shift gears here a little bit. So um, you, you were just sort of talking about like building those those structures for learning now. You had said, so you're, you're diagnosed ADHD not that long ago. And one of the things that you shared with me that you've been struggling with is creating routines and structure. Yes. And, and I'm very curious because often, you know, in coaching, we always say like the client actually already knows the answer. It's just the coach's like work is to sort of help pull that out of the, the client. And I'm wondering how much of what we've already just discussed, like, do you actually have the know-how? and just maybe haven't yet applied it to like your own personal life. It's much, much easier to solve other people's problems. Um, Hell yes, it is. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, absolutely. So I do know that um, uh, uh, that the challenge of, of setting aside or giving up things which take up time uh, and energy is is probably the first, first part of this is uh, 
the habits that I have. And I think especially with ADHD, I know that it's uh, ending things, sort of transitioning from one thing to another. And you find yourself scrolling on, on the internet. And of course, you know you want to stop, and the, but you just don't. Uh, I've, I've started giving myself countdowns, sort of five, four, three, right? Close Twitter. But I think sometimes there are certain coping mechanisms. And of course, for someone like myself, who was diagnosed later in life, um, I've probably got a bunch of coping mechanisms, which are taking up a lot of time and energy, uh, which if I can replace them with better coping mechanisms could give me more space for the things I want to be focused on. So is that, you know, you use the, the analogy earlier that people don't want to drill, they want a hole. Is what you just sort of said, you know, what, what's your why as to why you want to create uh, more routine and have more structure? Mm. What will that, what will that get for you? That's interesting. I think genuinely um, the, the deep why of all of that is that sense of having a, a, a sense of place in time. Um, sort of time blindness and sort of the, the feeling of just sort of moving through life without any sense of where I am in life. That is an issue for me. So I think one of the things and the reasons I crave that sort of structure is so that I can get a, a, a bearing on where I am, what I'm doing and understand why I'm doing it. Otherwise, I think I can, I can easily spend entire days sort of lost and I get to the end of the day and feel very kind of unmoored and, uh, and, and uh, dispirited by the, the, the lack of progress on things that matter. Are there certain areas in your life where you do have uh, a good amount of structure and, and have good routines? Bloody hell. Um, <laughs> sorry, I don't know if that one's okay. That was weird. Um, uh, do you know what? Possibly, so I cook. I'm the only household cook. Okay. And I think I'm good at meal times. I can do that. I know how to make a meal. I tend to make them on time. I tend to get roughly the right amount. I don't follow recipes, never have been able to, but I enjoy the process of, of, uh, of coming up with meals. That's pretty much the most structured part of my day is when I cook, because uh, you're dealing with physical things, you know, um, ingredients, heat, uh, time, and so on. These things are, uh, uh, they force a certain uh, linear process. Uh, you can't cook the, uh, the, the, so you call courgettes zucchini, I think. Well, what did you call it? Courgettes. I was going to say, I was going to say courgettes. And then I realized probably, uh, I've never heard the, that. most of the audience, I think you call it the, the, the green things, yeah. the, the, yeah. Um, uh, the zucchini, you call them zucchini, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, uh, we call them courgettes. Okay. Uh, so, um, you can't, you can't cook the, the, the zucchini, um, until you've chopped it. So this kind of forces you into a sort of linear, a linear process. And I'm getting better at my evening routine where I try and sort of meditate and, and, and journal before bed. You said that you, you're good at the, the, the uh, making the meals because it's a linear process. But the other thing that cooking also is, is that it's very tactile. Mm. How much do you think of your learning process and how you go through the day? Like, do you do best when you can physically touch the thing? Mm, that is probably that's probably a good good question. Um, I have noticed more recently this need for physical movement um, and and physical interacting with things in order to to stay focused. So I suspect a part of the process here will be to to put in place yeah, physical spaces in which uh, I can I can do things. Tricky. We have small houses over here. You probably expect, you know, American houses are much bigger. You know, imagine what you would consider a shed. Most people in the UK live in something like that. But uh, so L that's, less that's a tricky clean thing. Up. Uh, let, there is less to clean up. That is true. <laughs> but uh, so that's always been a tricky part. Fortunately, I now have a, an office space and I'm uh, I'm looking to use this space to, to build some certain uh certain structures in here where it's like okay here over here is where i sit to meditate over here is where i do my journal that kind of thing can be helpful and having objects to trigger uh trigger those processes i think would you say that one of the the biggest challenges for you is like transitioning and and ending activities yeah especially if i'm enjoying them uh uh, the anything that's giving me a little sort of drip, drip, drip dopamine sort of feed is very difficult to switch off. So I'm wondering what you might be able to do to make that more physical. Hmm. Interesting. Because think about it, like you, you said, you, the part of your routine that you're good at is meal prep. 
Yeah. You're creating physical spaces for different things. Like everything that you were describing, that you were doing well, it sounds like, has a physical component to it. Right, right. So what could I do? Uh, I mean, I suppose, um, I don't, can you get those self-destructing kind of uh, messages like they have in, uh, in, in Mission Impossible? Can I, can I get those? Uh, somebody, <laughs> can Twitter self-destruct after 10 seconds? If- well, I think there, is, there are absolutely tools yeah. that, that you can do that with. Yeah. There are also, I mean, you can also get, there's, there's timers that you can use, um, like, or even like an alarm clock that you actually have to get up for. You know, it's, I mean, think, yes. think about like, I mean, it is way too easy to hit snooze or stop on the, the alarm that's going off on our phone or on our, uh, on our smartwatch, right? Like if we need to actually get up, it sort of like breaks the trance, right? Have you seen a show called Wallace and Gromit? Have you heard of Wallace and Gromit? Over I have. There? He's an inventor. Wallace is an inventor and um, he has a bed that sort of flips up. And sort of he slides off it and he falls into his trousers. Uh Um, Possibly I could invest in one of those. Um, I don't know if they're commercially available. (laughs) So uh, that's that's one idea. um, Can you think of any other ideas? (laughs) Yeah, I think. um, Let's see. Let's see. Getting up, getting up in the morning. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm getting better at that. It's going to bed that's the tricky part. I suppose I could have all the lights switch off at a certain time. Just like automate that, get some smart lights, all the lights go off. And I stumble to bed. Hopefully that, you know, the problem is if I do that, I'll be carrying something, you know, like <laughs> I'll be like, oh, I best tidy up the kitchen. I'll be halfway through moving the china around. And yeah, but I could do that. That's a possibility. Something to do with the lights or, uh, or the internet, possibly getting rid of the internet after a certain time of night. Okay. That could be interesting. So part of your question was like, how do I build structure? Well, you need a foundation, right? And so when we're talking about building our routines into something that is that you already have, you know, that's why I asked you about where do you have routines already? Are there things that you can anchor and connect what you're trying to create and build to what you've already created and built? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think um, one thing that I'm trying to do, and I think I should lean into more is, um, is to exercise in the mornings before I work. Um, unfortunately, I have a fairly flexible working, uh, working hours and my gym is really close to my daughter's school. So I can drop her off and go there. And I think building that into um, uh, even even when I don't feel like working out, that's the tricky part, of course, is maintaining the pattern of behavior, even if it's just, okay, I'm going to idly walk on the treadmill sort of slightly uphill for 25 minutes and then call it a day. It still starts to cement the process of being there and going there and having that as as, as the way your, your morning is structured. So I think um, doing it, even if it's going to be rubbish, I think perfectionism is a major problem for people with ADHD. Uh, it certainly is for me, that feeling of why bother going to the gym unless I'm going to do like a Arnold Schwarzenegger style sort of routine um, and, and completely destroy myself. Whereas, of course, you know, you can only do that occasionally. You need to have the, the you need to have the crap days as well. You know, and those crap days are actually one of the best things we can do to really strengthen routines. You know, it's the, those days where you're like, so let, let's say you, you've gotten yourself into a good workout routine and like, oh, but today you got behind and you literally only have 10 minutes, mm. work out 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Like it actually strict because what you want to do is, is have more frequency versus intensity when it comes to, to working out. Yeah. I think, I think that's probably, um, if there was one sort of core concept to remember from this is that something, even something rubbish, if it's part of a part of the routine if it's part of a pattern it still has the job of maintaining that pattern and therefore it isn't a waste of time even if in itself it doesn't do a lot for you because 10 minutes workout is not going to change the world but if that 10 minute workout perpetuates the pattern of going to the gym uh it has that value i think sometimes i forget that that actually just the pattern in of itself is worth is worth the uh the effort so let's, this. let's take one more quick break here. Um, when we come back, let's just continue this conversation. So we will be right back. 
If you are enjoying this podcast and if you are new to this podcast, I want to let you know about all of our other podcasts that we have here on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Go check out ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan, Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb, ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens, and the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle with ADHD Rewired Coach Moira Mabin. You can find all of these shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network or just search your podcast player for any of those shows I just named. Then every second Tuesday of the month, you can join the whole ADHD Rewired podcast family, including Coach Cat Hoyer, for our monthly live Q&A. Our next live Q&A is on Tuesday, April 12th at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. To register so you can join us on Zoom, head on over to ADHDrewired.com slash events. Click on the register here under the events banner so you can get notified of our next monthly live Q&A and all of the other Q&As after that. If you enjoy the show and are getting value from it, make sure you hit subscribe so you always get episodes automatically uploaded to your podcast player. And please consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast player that accepts reviews. Did I suggest that you smash that subscribe button? You don't want to miss any of these episodes. Whether you've been listening for a while or you're joining us for the first time, thank you for listening and being a part of this community. Discover more from ADHD Rewired by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. That's ADHDrewired.com. Hey, would you like to show some extra support for this podcast? Consider becoming a patron and get extra goodies over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Thank you so much to our newest patrons, MRR, Sarah S, and Vendranda V, who joined us over the past week. Thank you so much for your support. Perks for our patrons start at just $5 a month, which you will get ad-free episodes of the show right into your favorite podcast player. At just $5 a month, you can listen to this show all the way through with no interruptions. Then at $25 a month, you can join me for a group coaching call every fourth Tuesday of the month, which means our next patron-only coaching call is today, March 22nd at 3 p.m. Central. That's 1 p.m. Pacific. Or Eastern. I am so grateful for the support of our Patreon community. Your support has helped our team grow so we can keep reaching all of our ADHD friends around the globe because we don't have to navigate this alone. Truly, your support is so appreciated and thank you for helping us make the world a little bit more ADHD friendly. Perks for our patrons start at $5 a month. $25 a month gets you a seat at our monthly group coaching call and support can start at any amount that makes sense to you. Consider becoming a patron if you love this show and the work that we are doing by going to ADHDrewire.com slash Patreon or just click the Patreon tab at the top of the page at ADHDrewired.com. Thanks, everyone. All right, we are back. So we were talking about routines and structure. We were talking about uh, building in uh, exercise. So let me ask you, how how often right now are you actually exercising? Now's a really bad time to ask me that question. Um, actually, I went today. I did go to the gym today, uh, but that was the first time in a number of weeks. So I think the, uh, the Christmas, New Year's period sort of, I'm going to blame Christmas and New Year's, um, but uh, it's it's been a bit of a, a discombobulating period. I don't know if there's um, I don't know if there's a, a commonality of people with ADHD who find sort of the weirdness of Christmas and New Year's, where like all your normal structures will fall away for a weird period, and you you know. Um, but I find it very difficult. I, I do think that is a very common uh, uh, thing, which is also why for th- something like exercise, for example, how we have to really like. Yes, it's inconvenient and yes, it's out of the routine. And yes, that's actually the very reason why if we can sort of set ahead of time, you know, no matter what's going on, I'm going to get a workout, excuse me, I'm going to get a workout in. You know, I know for from my own personal experience, you know, I uh, working out has been been a, a huge way that I manage my ADHD really for the last 10 or so years. That's it's really been a core component of, of my ADHD management. And I have gone through uh, periods where it's it's slipped away. And the, the times where that has happened is when I've had like conferences that brought me out of town 
um, when I got sick, you know, things that just threw me off my routine. And so I noticed this pattern. So I said, okay, like if I'm going to go to a conference or I'm going out of town, I have to make sure that I know that the, maybe the hotel I'm staying at has a, a place where I can work out. Right? Otherwise I got to find another place to stay. So really creating those routines that sort of anchor the rest of your day, bringing that with you. I remember uh, a couple of years ago when I moved, that was one of my biggest like fears. It was like, oh my, all my environmental cues are going to be gone now because I'm moving to a new environment, right? So I have to reestablish all of that. So even though I knew I was going to be exhausted and probably sore from the move, I made this really uh, strong determination that the morning that I wake up in my new house, I'm going to get a workout in, like no matter what jumping over the boxes, like go get my workout in. Cause it's about building those routines in the physical environment. Cause we, as people with ADHD, we are so cued to our environment that we have to really like recognize how significant environmental cues are. So if we are in a new environment, we have to just scaffold those cues for us very deliberately and very intentionally. Yeah. I, I find that's very true with things. Like I've, I've often attempted to try and work out at home. It never works. I have to be able to go to a gym because there's just it's it's very very difficult in the environment where you have the yeah, the sofa and the television and the and the fridge. So yeah, having that place and the other side of that is that sort of that awareness of environment. Um, I've often wondered if it's an introverted kind of uh, tendency to be very uh, emotionally affected by the environment i.e. being in an environment that's extremely say noisy or busy or or possibly just a bit ugly it's just not a very well kept environment it's a bit chaotic i find it very hard just to be in those spaces and i've often thought that was an extroversion introversion thing as in like hyper awareness of environment but it because you know with, with your mentioning how important environment is for people with adhd i wonder now if it's more of an adhd thing yeah, I mean, as far as like introversion, extroversion, I, I don't know if I would say that, that the connection is that because I think of introversion and extroversion is, is how are we energized by people or are we drained by people? But I think that being more sensitive to our environment and how we are, how our environment affects us, I think that there's a lot of different ways, but I do think being cognizant uh, of that is really, really important to do. So looking at the, the structures that you find to be most important for you to build right now, right? Because we can't, we can't create routines in every area of life all at once. It's like... Mm. You I sure? Mean, can't, can't we? Um. So, so, <laughs> yeah. so let, let me ask uh, the, the person who helps uh, with adult learning, uh, how much new information can you add on to what you already know? Oh, blimey. Um, what, in a day or like... Just uh, in general. Is there, is there like a target oh. kind of... Um, do you know, I, I don't think, I don't know of a, of, a, of a number around that. I think it very much depends upon um, on how you're absorbing the information and, and it's, um, what's it, it's salience to you. People who are fairly, um, uh, fairly well versed in a particular topic can probably take on quite a lot of new information in that area because they have a lot of hooks for it, a lot of uh, places. That I, I know how to structure that information. When if you're uh, receiving information on something which is completely boring to you and has no relevance to a thing you already know, I don't suppose you can take in any uh, at all. So it's probably quite varied. My, uh, I think my question was more of a leading question than I thought you were going to actually have a different answer to. Uh, <laughs> um so what I have heard is that to really um, get uh, real learning is that 80% of what you're working with needs to be layering on top of things you've already mastered. Right. Okay. Yeah. That, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. So, you know, leaving that, like, it's a 20% sort of new. So where is that 20% new that you want to yeah. focus on? Okay. I think, I think the new part for me is going to be in having sort of physical cues for things. I think um, people talk about sort of laying out their gym kit the night before. So that's the first thing they see when they wake up. Um, the, uh, you know, having, having something more physical uh, for each of the things that, that will trigger that behavior uh, and something that I can prepare in advance. Um, I think that's, that's the part which is new for me. I think uh, habit, uh, Habit stacking. Stacking, yes. I think I think trying to to stack things. There are things that you do because you do them, and and stacking these new habits onto those things within a physical space. I think is something I've not really given enough effort or, or focus before. 
Can you uh, can you come up with maybe a couple things that you mm. can create and set in your environment that would help cue you? Okay. Well, I mean, I mentioned the gym kit. I think having uh, having having nice clothes that I want to wear to the gym that would help. I should invest in some some decent gym clothes that I want to put those on because they're nice clothes. And uh, once I've got them on, we'll seem silly not to go to the gym. Uh, so uh, I think I think that's probably one that I will work on. I think having a particular spot in my office where I could put my meditation cushion and sort of set up for me to sit and meditate. I've never had that before, and I think that might help in terms of like uh, I finish the day, I get up from my desk. Aha! There's my uh, my my cushion. I'll go and uh, I'll go and sit for ten minutes. Um, I think something like that would be very useful as well. Um, and I think. There's another one which I think has to do with evening routines and to do with sleep and sleep hygiene, but I don't quite know what that is yet. But uh, I think I think some kind of structured sort of approach towards sort of closing down for the day would be helpful. I'm just not entirely sure what that is yet. Would you be willing to create maybe for like a week uh, just a, an activity log of the things that you do from uh, basically after dinner to bedtime? That's interesting. I'd be very willing to. Uh, whether I do it um, is is a uh, is a completely different question. But I'm very willing to try to do it because I think that sometimes when we can actually see all of the activities that we are actually doing, uh, including how long those things take us, we're kind of laying out the pieces to a puzzle. And when we can see all those pieces in front of us, because this is something that that I've done and I, I do in our coaching groups is like when you see it in front of you, it often becomes so clear as to one, what needs to happen, and two, all the inefficiencies that we didn't realize what we were sort of creating only because we now see it all as a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. I did this with my uh, bedtime routine uh, a little while ago. And one of the things that I found is that I would go back and forth between my bedroom and, uh, and bathroom probably five or six different times. And every time I cross the threshold from one room to another is an opportunity to get distracted. So if I could figure out a way to decrease the amount of times I needed to, to uh, you know, go from one room to the other and sort of chunk those activities, it probably cut about 20 minutes off my uh, evening routine. I'm 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 now just trying to figure out what you go to the bathroom five times in the evening for. Oh well, it's, um, it's getting you know it's getting something because it's like God God forbid I uh, I uh, don't listen to a podcast while brushing my teeth and I just yeah. You know. Oh yeah. Well, how can you? That's, that's like two whole minutes of uh, of of just standing there with a toothbrush in your mouth. Yeah, absolutely. It's ridiculous. Who does that without entertainment? Um. But it, it, I think when when we look at our own behaviors that way, it's that that it puts that process of sort of metacognition, that 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 observing how we think, that thinking of our thinking, it kind of puts it into manual because we don't do it really well on autopilot. Yeah, I think that's true of um, of uh, everyone, not just uh, uh, we ADHD is. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So um, I want to make sure that you are uh, leaving this conversation with at least a couple clear commitments that you want to uh, try to tackle. Mm, commitments. Yes. So what do we got? Um, I think the, the gym thing, I'm going to, the, the commitment there is very simple. I, the, the something is better than nothing uh, principle applies. So essentially, even if it's going to be rubbish, go. Um, I think that's something I can do. I think the, I'm going to leave the evening routine till last because that's my white whale. Um, I think the, the, having a, uh, a physical place for meditation and uh, so sort of setting up a sort of, you know, somewhere to, to do that and have that as a, a trigger. And that's going to help both in the morning and the evening, because I think, I want to try and bookend the day with that kind of thing. It's a nice way to sort of quiet the racing mind, especially in the evening, and to get yourself in the right space for the beginning of the day. I think having a, a meditation space of some sort set up uh, in my office uh, that is, you know, something something I can I can realistically achieve. Are you open to a suggestion? Yeah. So uh, you are a member of Adult Study Hall, correct? Mm, yes. So 
if you were finishing up your your day in there and he put and he shared in the in study hall what your plan for winding down the your work day so maybe it's a 10 minute meditation is like by a certain time um and you can literally do it on camera uh if you're comfortable with doing that um mm-hmm. I, I you know you you said that having peer supported uh, learning is really helpful. Don't use don't use my own uh, words against me like that. It's terribly <laughs> it's, it's, unfair. It's the best way um, to go. <laughs> Look, just because I tell other people to do these things does not mean I want to be told to do them. Uh, <laughs> well, I have to say that the the advice that we the best advice we give is usually the, the advice that we need to take more than anything else. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, it is, uh, and that's so irritating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right yeah absolutely so there's kind of an accountability um thing there which i think is interesting and uh, one of the things i want to try and do is if i can try and get more uh, sort of people in my time zone um uh onto adult study hall or find the ones that are there uh, because most of them will be very confused if i tell them i'm about to go to bed um and like, what? we have people so from all there. from like every every continent it's awesome. I, I need to find. I need to find more of my uh, European brethren and uh, sistren. But um, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, this is really fun. I hope that you found some value uh, in this. I appreciate you sharing some Absolutely, of your yeah. uh, stuff you do professionally, and uh, hopefully, this uh, conversation helped you also uh, personally with looking at some things around uh, structure and routine. And I hope that it also uh, helps listeners as well. So thank you so much. Me too. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. 
Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni, Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson, The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer, The Body Keep Score by Bessel van der Kolk, Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang, The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown, The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris, Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.